Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Baptist Renewal podcast. I'm Matt Emerson. I'm one of the directors for CBR. We're joined today by Luke Stamps, who's also a director at CBR, and by Jesse Owens, who is professor of historical and systematic theology and program coordinator for the Master of Arts in Theology and Ministry at Welch College. And CBR, if you don't know, is a group of Orthodox Evangelical Baptists committed to retrieving the great tradition for renewal of Baptist faith and practice. If you enjoy what you hear today, we invite you to check out our website at centerforbaptistrenewal.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at, at Baptist Renewal and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Baptist Renewal. Of course, don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends. Uh, in today's show, we're discussing one of our favorite 17th century general Baptist, Thomas Monk, and his work, A Cure for the Cankering Error of the New Eutychians. And I'm not going to read the rest of the title because that's not all of it, but that's uh, the gist. And our guest today is, as I said, Dr. Jesse Owens. Jesse, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you all for having me. Absolutely. So, um, Jesse, if you don't mind, could you kick us off by just telling us a little bit about Thomas Monk, his life, um, what he was doing, and why he decided to write a book about the, can the cankering error of the New Eutychians. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Monk was a General Baptist uh, pastor in the Midlands, and um, so he comes of age and is ministering during the Restoration, um, so Charles II, uh, coming to the throne, and so he experiences some persecution for his faith as well. Uh, there is an interesting story in uh, Thomas Crosby's History of the Baptist where Monk and some other Baptists are put in prison in Ellsbury. Um, and uh, it's interesting, someone goes from Ellsbury to London and actually uh, finds William Kiffin. And Kiffin is involved in getting Monk and some of these other Baptists out of prison there. So I think essential to understanding Monk is thinking about that time period. You can also see this, by the way, in the General Baptist Standard Confession, uh, where when they present uh, the confession to Charles II, they, um, they talk about their willingness to suffer for their beliefs, but they want to, uh, to present them to him. So thinking about him growing up uh, and ministering during this period of persecution, I think, is essential. Um, this particular work is um, that we're looking at today, Cure for the Cankering Error, grows out of, I think, the rise of anti-Trinitarianism in England in the second half of the 17th century. So there is a, pro a proliferation of anti-Trinitarianism. We can think about um, particular figures like Paul Best and John Biddle, uh, who are known anti-Trinitarians. Um, but specifically, I think Monk has some concern about Matthew Caffin, who is a General Baptist pastor um, who seems to hold heterodox views um, on the doctrine of the Trinity, particularly the person of Christ. And there's some debate about what Caffin's actual views were. Um, some have said that he holds something like uh, Hoffmanite Christology. You can see the way in which uh, in this work, he uh, says on multiple occasions about um, Christ sort of passing through Mary like water passes through a pipe, which is a, a common reference attributed to, um, to Melchior Hoffman and a Hoffmanite Christology. So I think if you think about those things as, as Monk faithfully pastoring among the General Baptists, but dealing with persecution and with uh, the Caffin controversy, which goes on, by the way, from like the 1660s all the way into the beginning of uh, the 1700s, the 18th century. So it goes on for a long period of time. Um, there is uh, another work that he writes uh, about persecution uh, that, that he's a signatory of called Zion's Groans for Her Distressed, which is uh, an argument against uh, religious persecution in, in England, uh, but also uh, elsewhere throughout Europe. So that maybe kind of gives you an idea of Monk. Yeah, that's great. Um, anything either of you want to add about his other works, uh, in, in particular, uh, his or the suggestion that he's instrumental in the Orthodox creed? Any, any, anything you guys want to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, yeah, that's my understanding is that he's one of the principal authors of <clears throat> the Orthodox creed of the General Baptist, which is a, a fascinating uh confessional symbol uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because it's sort of the General Baptist attempt to incorporate some of the Westminsterian Protestant consensus of 
uh, the uh, nonconformists in the 17th century. Uh, we, we see that with the Savoy Declaration of the Congregationalists and of course the Second London Baptist Confession uh, of the particular Baptists. But uh, some of that, some of the language of the Articles of Religion and of the Westminster Confession of Faith make their way into uh, the, the general Baptist Orthodox Creed, which just shows you that there was a kind of um, Protestant Catholicity uh, among uh, the separatists in the, in the um, 17th century and the general Baptists, in particular Baptists, were both a part of that. The other thing that is remarkable about that confession is it's the only one that I'm aware of, the only confession of faith that I'm aware of that includes the full text of the three ecumenical creeds, um, which, and, and it includes the, the, the introduction to the creeds that's taken straight from the Church of England's articles of religion about the, the use of the creeds in, um, in, in Christian catechesis and so on. So it's just, it, Monk, Monk's, th this book that we're going to talk about is obviously a, an example of this as well, but it, it just shows that there was uh, a, a desire on the part of the Baptists, including the general Baptists, how, how far, how widespread that was, I guess, is some, uh, there's some debate about, right? The general Baptists, uh, as we can probably talk about, slide into some Trinitarian error over the next century. Uh, but there was at least this attempt uh, uh, among uh, Monk and his compatriots in the Midlands to try to, to try to say, you know, listen, we're Baptists in our distinctives, but we are also little c Catholic. We also are, are attempting to, to show our continuity with, um, you know, broader reformed Orthodox, uh, Protestant Orthodoxy on these issues. So that, that confession of faith is still very much worth um, consideration by contemporary Baptists. Yeah, and I would add to that, I, I think he is the primary author of an Orthodox creed for a, ver a variety of reasons. But um, as you think about what you read here in Cure for the Cankering Error, I, I don't know of any other General Baptist of this period that demonstrates the sort of acumen that he has on these issues. And if you think about the way in which an Orthodox creed in some of those early articles the emphasis on uh, the person of Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity, that gives you some of the context, I think, with anti-Trinitarianism and the Caffin controversy. But when I read what's written there, there are just so many similarities to what we find in this work that I do think he is, is the principal architect behind that. There's also another work um, that's published later, actually in the 18th century, that includes some correspondence potentially between he and Thomas Grantham, um, and, and if that is accurate, um, if that really is a letter from Thomas Grantham that's published in this, this 18th century work, um, then it, it seems as if Grantham attributes uh, the, the confession actually primarily to, to Thomas Monk. Mm. Well, uh, one thing that might be helpful for our listeners to kind of, because we, we, you know, there's some, some concepts that, that maybe not all of our listeners are familiar with. Um, so maybe we could clarify the context of this this book. Um, what is Hoffmanite Christology? And, and what is it that was so um, troubling about Caffin's uh, adoption of it uh, for, um, for Monk? Yeah, I'm glad to answer that. Um, so, um, so I think the concern it seems like with those who hold Hoffmanite Christology, and I think it comes out in this work is if Christ truly takes on um, uh, his flesh from Mary, if he receives it from Mary, um, does that affect his sinlessness in some way? And that seems to be an underlying concern that I think Monk is, is addressing here. Um, so, so I think that's part of the concern. Um, or does he receive uh, his flesh from heaven in some sense? So the doctrine of celestial flesh, uh, is there some sort of creation of, of flesh um, here that, that he is not drawn from, from Mary? Um, but Monk's point is, um, if he is not like us in this way, if he's not truly um, the, the seed of David, then he cannot be our redeemer. Uh, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't fulfill all of these promises about a descendant of David um, and, and, and the seed of Abraham, uh, fulfilling the, um, the covenant requirements on our behalf. And so I, I think the concern among uh, those who would hold a celestial flesh view or a Hoffmanite um, Christology, that is that Jesus did not receive his flesh from the Virgin Mary, are attempting to safeguard um, the holiness of Christ. 
Um, but, uh, but Monk says, and, and obviously he has answers for that in the virgin conception, but, uh, but he says, no, you don't realize you're actually undermining the way in which he identifies with us uh, in our very nature. So I think that kind of gets at the essence of it. Yeah, that's good. So let's shift a little bit to the, to the work we're talking about. What's the, what's kind of the general overview that we can help our listeners with in terms of the outline of the book? Um, maybe they've read it and still don't get it. Uh, and it would help to give them kind of a general sense, or maybe they haven't read it yet. And we just, you know, it, it might be helpful before we jump into some details to, to give our listeners that general outline. So what's, what's sort of the, the framework of the whole work uh, for Monk? Uh, I mean, from, from the way I see it, it's, it's kind of, um, it's kind of three, kind of threefold, uh, structure and purpose really of the book um in one sense he begins with a defense of what's sort of uh described these days as classical christian theism uh so a defense of um the classical attributes of god uh simplicity impassibility um omnipotence and so on, immu immutability right the, the things that that we associate with um the classical attributes of god uh but then also classical in addition to classical christian theism also classical trinitarianism right and so there's a defense of the one essence of god the the three persons only distinguished by their eternal relations of origin so very standard um, classical presentation of the trinity and then of course the, the primary impetus is is a defense of classical christology um uh, the kind of uh, in response to these um errors that we've been talking about uh, a defense of Chalcedonian Christology um, of Christ's you know, two natures and and his one hypostasis or person. So I mean it, that's that's the in, in the broadest sense I think what's what's going on here. It's also interesting though that the there are what a hundred pages on the practical use of or application of these doctrines. So almost half of the book is why does this matter? which I, I think is very fascinating. He, he obviously is very aware of the things he's discussing. I mean, you think about the way in which he discusses simplicity. He even seems to have an understanding maybe of, of perichoresis and there are all sorts of things he's addressing here, but he gives a hundred pages on why this actually matters. Um, so I, I don't know, I find that fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah, so let's clarify for listeners, what's, what are the new Eutychians? What is their cankering error? And what's the cure? Jesse, you want to take that one? Um, sure. I actually meant to write down exactly how he how he defines this. Um, so the idea seems to be um, that you have um, God essentially turned into human flesh or human form. So it's uh, the eternal son. Uh, ultimately becoming a uh, human person, person, but it's it's God turned into flesh. Uh, that seems to be uh, the critique. Yeah. So the Ut ancient the ancient Eutychians, um, an ancient heresy uh, in the era of the Church Fathers, believed that that Christ um, had only one nature, that the nature of God, and the nature of of his humanity, sort of merged um, uh, to to form one divine human nature um which is you know one of the one of the um one of the one of the uh phrases of uh the chalcedonian definition was was crafted precisely to to um guard against that right so the the in the chalcedonian definition uh, uh there's sort of um what are known as four alpha privatives that is their their negations they begin with the, the greek the greek letter alpha to negate uh, these things. So the, the, the union of Christ's two natures, um, they're, they're united without division and without separation on the one hand. That's those, those are guarding against the Nestorian or two persons heresy. But then also, it goes on to say, have two more negations without confusion and without change. And that seems to be especially aimed at this ancient heresy of Eutychianism, which kind of had this hybrid view that if that, that basically in becoming human, it's um, 
divinity as, as you know jesse described sort of divinity tr being transformed into uh human flesh uh in which case you know the ancient uh fathers and monk as well recognize that that um it, 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 if christ's two natures kind of merge into one then it, it he ends up being neither god nor man but a kind of tertium quid or a third thing that's neither god nor man so we really need to affirm not only the union of the two natures in the one person of Christ, but also that the two natures retain their distinctive properties, that they don't, they're not confused into one another. So the divinity is still divinity. Uh, the humanity is still true humanity. Um, they retain their distinctive properties. Their union is not in becoming one with each other, but in becoming united in the same hypostasis, the same person. So that's, that's, that's the, the language of Eutychianism that, that uh, Monk is picking up on it, he's seeing that these are sort of that what's going on with this um caffeinite christology the the, the christology of, of caffeine and other uh erroneous teachers is a kind of uh a renewal of that ancient eutychian error i think the primary text that he sees that flowing from is john 1 14 and the word became flesh mm. Uh, and that seems to be what he's addressing. You asked what the, the cure was. And um, I, I think um, I think Luke is, has answered that you know, clearly. But the, the answer is something like Chalcedonian Christology. Um, uh, Chalcedon's definition and, and its understanding of the, the two natures in the singular person uh, is the cure. Mm. And one of the things that I find so fascinating about this book um, I have it printed out. I don't know. I, I don't even know if you can buy this book anymore. I, I got this. Um, I got a copy of it from our friend John Gill, um, and not not that John Gill, you know, uh, the one that people might know from Baptist history. Do you know John Jesse? Do you know John Gill? I've met him at ETS. Yeah. Yeah. He, I think I moderated a, a section he was in one time. He's a good friend of ours. Uh, he's a Baptist historian um, from Northern California, but. It, it, his his carol at at southern seminary when we were both phd students was right next to mine his office was right next to mine in the library but i didn't know john at the time and i thought it was a joke i thought i thought that like some like clever librarian had put john gill's name on one of the offices as if it were the 18th century uh british baptist theologians bones in there or something like that and it wasn't until we moved to california that um i found out that john gill is actually a real living human uh, person. Uh, but anyway, uh, my friend John Gill, that historian printed or gave me the PDF for this. So I'm not sure um, how others might have it, but that's how we uh, distributed it in our um, in our reading challenge. But the thing that strikes me about his uh, treatment of of these classical doctrines is just how conversant he is, not only in scripture, I mean, principally, you know, his 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 primary um, proof of the, these doctrines is from scripture and he's obviously conversant in scripture but also just how deeply conversant he is in the tradition i mean just in the space of a few pages if i mean it, it, those of you who may be uh, looking at this at home um like in chapter three concerning christ our mediator uh he makes reference to the language of chalcedon um and its opposition to the ancient heresy of apollinarianism um and and just a few pages later uh, he's he's dealing with Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, quoting quoting uh, uh, from the five theological orations of Gregory of Nazianzus. He references the schoolmen or the scholastics, probably thinking about Thomas Aquinas there. Um, I know Aquinas is uh, a figure that we've covered on here uh, before on our podcast. Um, many many uh, Protestants are discovering that our own tradition uh, of refor of Protestant orthodoxy was very much indebted to. Uh, Thomas Aquinas and other scholastics of the medieval era, right? I mean, this is not uh, this is not new in Baptist life or in Protestant yeah. life uh, more generally. Monk, did Thomas Monk lead his congregation into Roman Catholicism after that? <laughs> yeah, it, it was on the 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 slippery slope to to papacy here. Uh, but no, I mean, he's quoting the schoolmen positively um, uh, in, in with regard to uh, the Trinitarian relations. Uh, also, he quotes Hilary of Poitiers quotes Augustine, um, quotes Nazianzus again, um, def defends the traditional view against the Sibelians. I mean, this just in, a, in the space of about 10 pages here, he, he, he ranges over 
uh, the whole of patristic and medieval uh, Christology and Trinitarianism, and also in the book shows indebtedness to the reformers and to you know other uh, reformed Orthodox authors as well. Um, which again, I just I, I find that uh, deeply fascinating uh, from a historical perspective, but also as a, a model and a, an exemplar uh, for for those of us who are trying to recover a sense of uh, little c Catholicity among the Baptist tradition, that this is not something that's alien to our, to our tradition. Uh, but both of the, the, the streams of Baptist life in, in uh, the 17th century, both the particular Baptist and the general Baptist in various ways, were trying to show their indebtedness to uh, this great tradition, this little c uh, Catholic, little o Orthodox tradition, recognizing that they stood on the shoulders of those who came before them. They weren't trying to overthrow uh, the creedal or conciliar foundations of the church. They were uh, trying to, to make certain uh, ecclesiological reforms uh, related to uh, the church and the sacraments, but they weren't trying to, to create a new sect. In fact, they were at great pains to show that they were not falling in, even with the errors of some of the Anabaptists, right, who had committed some of these uh, Christological errors. So, Anyway, Monk is, is, uh, is dear to me because of that, uh, that kind of model that he gives for Baptist Catholicity. I would say, by the way, and you, you all may have discussed this on another podcast, if you want to get an even fuller sense of that, um, Madison Grace from at Southwestern republished um, an Orthodox creed with the mm -hmm. preface there. And the preface just makes that so clear, the way in which they see themselves um, falling within the Christian tradition and even the Reformed tradition, and how they're gladly drawing on those things and repeating them even. Um, they make it very clear they're not interested in novelty. Uh, they're not looking for something new. Um, they're glad to, to speak with the language of Zion, they actually say, uh, mm -hmm. and those, those Christians who have come before them. Um, so I think if you look at the preface to an Orthodox creed, that's very clear as well. One thing I would add is I still don't know how to make sense of, of what Monk is doing here as far as how he's aware of all of these things. Um, so my understanding of Monk from, um, from, from everything I've seen, seen and researched is that he comes from a farming family. So how, how this guy is a dissenter, is a Baptist, comes from a farming family, seems to have no university education, is not really in a position, I would say, in this sort of tumultuous era that he lives in, um, to uh, make use of some other things that maybe people have in the, in the next century. So I, I really I have a hard time even figuring out uh, how he pulls all of this off. I was reading, um, I was reading a history um, of uh, just England and, and descent in the 17th century. And I noticed uh, Ernest Gordon Rupp says this of Monk's Cure for the Cancrean Air. He says that no Anglican of Monk's time produced an abler defense of the doctrine of the Trinity. And I think mm -hmm. that's true. Uh, I, I still just, uh, maybe someone can explain to me uh, how he even came upon these things. I would love to know. Yeah. Uh, also, just as a, an, a, by way of analogy, the same thing could be said um, with a little less um, surprise, I suppose, but, but the same thing, a similar thing could be said of John Gill, and the, like the, the OG John Gill uh, <laughs> from the 18th century, who also, because he was the son of a Baptist, uh, was kept out of university education um, and, and had to be, become basically an autodidact, had to teach himself uh, Greek and Hebrew and Latin, had to teach himself the church fathers and the medieval theologians, and also produce what many consider one of the best defenses of the Trinity um, in the next century. So, uh, you know, I don't, we don't, we don't want to beat our chest too much uh, on, on here, but I mean, it, sometimes I feel like we have to as Baptists because we, uh, our tradition is treated as if it was, uh, as if it, if, as if it were only ever characterized by a kind of theological malnourishment. And as it turns out, if you go back to uh, these earliest uh, centuries of the Baptist movement, um, they, they produced uh, some, some of the best defenses of the, the doctrine, the, the Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity uh, of their time. Uh, they were, you know, in Gill's case, that was read, uh, you know, for uh, a century or more after. Yeah, and and go ahead, Jesse, sorry. I was gonna say, it's because they're so conversant in the tradition too. Uh, as I was going back through this, I was thinking about um, Stephen Holmes has that fascinating little essay. I think it's like the title is something like the dangers of reading just the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously, um, obviously Monk is 
interacting with the biblical text all over the place. Um, but, um, but he's also asking, how have Christians throughout the centuries read the text? How have they understood this? Um, and so I, I'm sympathetic to, um, to, and I'm sure you all are as well, um, to Holmes' argument about just sort of reading the reading scripture without any reference to the, the tradition is, um, can potentially be dangerous. And I think we see that in a lot of Christological heresy on the 17th and in the 18th century. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, right. It's so, uh, you know, I think one thing that I want to emphasize here, and we were going to get to this towards the end, but we can go ahead and hit it since uh, y'all have brought it up so ably. Uh, I think it's important to continue to emphasize that that monk is connected to the tradition, both because, you know, it's another example of a Baptist in the 17th century who's connected, as you both have, have pointed out. But Luke mentioned something in, in, rel in relative passing that I want to zone in on for a second, which is that Thomas Monk is a general Baptist, not a particular Baptist. Um, so this is a, what we, we might call today a non-Calvinist Baptist. Um, we have Jesse on today, in part because he is teaching at a Baptist college that is part of the free will Baptist tradition. Um, and so, you know, I think sometimes even, even our fellow Baptists get the impression that it was only the particular Baptists, only the, 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 the Calvinistic Baptists or the reformed Baptists, or however you want to say that, that were interested in retaining uh, Trinitarian and Christological orthodoxy with respect to the continuity of the tradition. That's just not true. We, we see that in the general Baptist as well here with, with uh, this work also in the Orthodox creed, but um, there are other examples as well from other early general Baptist confessions of faith so that, you know, it's, it's a, it's a mistake to think that it was only the particular Baptists in the 17th century who were interested in making sure that what they were saying was intricately connected to and in line with the great tradition with respect to the Trinity and Christology and with the Reformation with respect to soteriology. I mean, there's lots of different ways we can sort of dig in on all those particulars. Um, you know, there are some general Baptists who uh, toy around with, at the very least, uh, some interesting things in soteriology with respect to original sin and that sort of thing. But I mean, we could talk about the ways that particular Baptists also toy around with things related to soteriology to the point where John Gill's, you know, accused of being a, a hyper-Calvinist. So, I mean, you know, I think obviously you can get into the weeds and go, well, in this case and in this case, there's deviation, which is okay, fair in those particulars, but broadly speaking, more broadly speaking, both general and particular Baptists demonstrate a overwhelming desire to show their continuity with the great tradition with respect to Trinity and Christology and with the Reformation with respect to soteriology. Anything you guys want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think you could add to it from, from the general Baptist perspective. There, there are plenty of others, um, but probably the most well-known would be Thomas Grantham. Uh, in Christianismus Primitivus, you can see something similar to what you see in Monk, uh, the way he cites um, the Protestant scholastics, the way in which he cites the early uh, church fathers, um, <clears throat> as well as um, the reformers. Uh, you can see that very clearly. He reprints the Nicene Creed in, um, in Christianismus Primitivus. So yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. There are great pains to show their, their continuity uh, with the tradition uh, and, and with the Reformed tradition. Of course, being Baptist, they realize that, um, uh, and maybe more so for the general Baptist, because there's some soteriological distinctions as well. Although I would say that uh, Monk and an Orthodox creed, and, and in some ways, honestly, even the standard confession, um, take pains to show the ways in which things aren't as different as people might assume. Um, but, but being Baptist, obviously they're, they're having to, they're receiving the tradition and they're drawing from it, but they're also, um, deviating from it in significant ways, um, on, on the issue of baptism. So, I mean, I think that's sort of a, a, a line they're always, always walking, but, but always whenever and wherever possible, affirming the tradition, uh, and it's right interpretation of scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm curious to hear, um, where we stand 
today from your perspective? I mean, you are uh, teach at a, at a Free Will Baptist College. You did uh, graduate work at a Southern Baptist Seminary. So you you you've lived in both worlds and trafficked in both worlds. Like, what are there signs of any any kind of um, I don't know renewed sense of solidarity between um, Southern Baptists, you know, more indebted to the particular Baptist tradition, and Free Will Baptists, more indebted to the General Baptist tradition. I think so. I, I've seen a lot of, and maybe it's just the circles I'm in, but I've seen a lot of uh, conversations recently between Arminian Baptists and let's say Calvinist Baptists, um, one of the things that we seem to have de-emphasized is a historic understanding of what it means to be Baptist. And I think the more we actually plumb the depths of that, the more it helps sort of uh, bring us together, even though there are some important soteriological differences, we realize the unity on uh, these issues, on the nature of the church uh, and, and of baptism, which, um, which it's interesting if you look at the back of uh, the, the very end of, uh, of this work, um, Thomas Monk says that he has this other work that he hopes to publish and he hopes it'll actually uh, bring some other Baptists, bring Baptists together. I, I do think we see something of that in our own day as we recover Baptist identity. It's not just soteriology, but it has to do with the nature of the church and the ordinances and all of these things. I think it does show the unity and continuity between um, general and particular Baptists or Arminian and Calvinist Baptists in a way that we probably have overlooked in the past. So I'm hopeful about, uh, about that sort of thing. I think what you all are doing at Center for Baptist Renewal goes a long way towards that, uh, as, as well as some other things. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think we're in a better place than, than we have been. Mm. Yeah, it's my, I mean, it's, it's sort of one of my, um, hopes, I guess, uh, uh, is the best way to put it, hopes and, and, and prayers is that we would see more, um, more of that. And just, just, again, we're not going to create a new connection, you know, like, like there was in a previous century. Uh, you know, our, our differences remain, they remain important, especially around uh, perseverance of the saints and, and, and so on. And, and we don't want to try to paper over those differences, but at the same time, I, I would like to see more Baptist uh theologians on the southern baptist side of things um have a, a a deeper sense of our baptist identity you know i think for a lot of baptists they they see themselves fundamentally as reformed uh in their own definition of that and we've talked some about that whether or not we can use that qualifier um to describe baptist but they see themselves fundamentally as reformed and and sort of baptist distinctives are, are kind of add-on you know it's sort of like an appendix to their fundamental theology is you know um and and again some of that's good and right you know like there there, there is a a hierarchy of of doctrine i think that we can speak of there uh, but at the same time i'd like to see more of a sense of like a, a kind of pan-baptist identity that like you know we we are in solidarity with these other uh free church traditions especially others that wear the capital b baptist uh name um, around, uh, as you said, the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the ordinances, uh, the relation of the church to the state, and so on. I don't know. What do you think, Matt? How, how can we foster more more Baptist solidarity? Well, I, I mean, I agree. I think that uh, the president of Welch College, where Jesse works, Matthew Pinson, uh, has done a lot from his end uh, to, to be present at various gatherings like at ETS and the Baptist studies group. And, um, you know, we, we've had some, we've had a couple of um, congenial conversations with him. Um, and so I agree. I, I would like to see more of an effort, uh, especially from the Southern Baptist side to, <laughs> to acknowledge that there are other Baptists among us um, that, love Jesus, that take scripture seriously, that are orthodox in their doctrine of the Trinity and, and doctrine of Christology, and that are committed to the same Baptist principles that we are, even if we differ uh, with respect, especially to soteriology. So, um, and, you know, honestly, in the, in, in the SBC, there are certain segments of the SBC, perhaps even large segments of the SBC, that may feel more akin to other kinds of Baptists with respect to soteriology than they feel kinship with, say, 
Reformed Baptists on the doctrine of salvation. So, you know, um, there, there's, there's sort of a, I don't know, quarter century history of the Southern Baptist Convention speaking of itself as a kind of pinnacle in certain ways of, of not only Baptist life, but of even Christianity. The last best hope of earth. Yeah. And I just, I think we need to get away from that and, and uh, recognize that God is at work among many groups, including yeah. ours, uh, but, but others as well, especially those that share so many of our same commitments, both the, the big, the big ones, quote unquote, and our denominational distinctives. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we, we can, I think, end our conversation today in the last few minutes that we have together, coming back to something that Jesse, you mentioned a few times, <clears throat> which is Thomas Monk's interpretation of scripture. So for, for all of us, are there particular points in this work that we've read or elsewhere where Thomas Monk demonstrates a particular exegetical method or uses a particular hermeneutical approach that uh, is interesting to you that demonstrates a connection with the tradition that that shows his um, adeptness at using scripture to or demonstrating from scripture the error that he's combating what would you say about his exegetical and hermeneutical method Um, on 119, he has this something that seems like a kind of fourfold use of scripture, um, where he says we, we interpret the text historically, um, analogically, allegorically, and morally, which I found that to be, um, I found that to be interesting. I think the text he used, by the way, to defend the doctrine of the Trinity and, uh, and Orthodox Christology, um, they're, they're texts you would expect that you would see in other places. There were a couple that, that caught me off guard, and maybe it's just a lack of awareness I have. I can't remember if it's Genesis 19, um, but he, he talks about uh, Abraham's experience with the two sort of angelic beings and then interacting with, uh, with the father on, uh, I think it's Sodom and Gomorrah, and he sees that as, um, um, as Abraham encountering um, the three persons and within the Godhead, and he actually says it's in this way that Abraham uh, the, the text is able to say of Abraham that he saw my day, Jesus says, he saw my day and was glad. Um, I, I hadn't honestly encountered that before, but uh, I thought his fourfold use uh, was interesting. But again, the majority of the text he, he deals with, I think, are, are common texts. You also see partitive exegesis, as it's sometimes called, you know, uh, discerning whether a text is speaking about Christ um, as the son of God as God himself, or whether it's speaking about Christ with reference to his incarnate human nature, uh, which is an ancient practice. It goes all the way back to the Cappadocian fathers and before. So, you know, I think that's, that comes up in several places. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, we've mentioned some of this uh, before, like with Benjamin Keach, uh, it's the, it's the same sort of approach to scripture. It's just in continuity with the tradition. Obviously, there's a, temper, uh, a tempered use or even reference, as Jesse mentioned, to something like the fourfold sense, but the, the early Baptists were not afraid to read all of Scripture as a reference to Christ. Uh, they were not afraid to read all of Scripture Scripture with uh, what, I, what I and Luke have referred to elsewhere as tropological immediacy, that is, every text has immediate application to the church and is for, written for the church. Um, they were not afraid to read scripture in ways um, that saw every text as having um, its fulfillment in Christ's return, uh, his second coming. So, you know, I think it's evident also that Monk, Keach, all these other folks that we've talked about and will talk about, um, also are influenced by the Reformation and, and want to demonstrate the validity of what they're saying from the details of the text. So, you know, this is not a situation where they're divorcing text from doctrine, um, but it is the case that their, their interpretive method has much more in common with, say, Augustine and Anselm than it does with, uh, you know, James Barr, 
for instance. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think I think you know, just in general, Thomas Monk, like we've said, is just yet, yet another example of an early Baptist who wants to demonstrate continuity with the tradition in a variety of ways. Continuity with the Reformation with respect to soteriology, and and the commitment to Baptist principles in the midst of that. Well, thank you, Jesse, for being on with us today. Uh, we're, we're grateful for you. We're grateful for Welch College, uh, grateful for Dr. Pinson and the work that you're doing there. And um, we'll close with the grace as we normally do. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>